How you doing, everybody? Today we are going to take a quick look at the latest entry in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. This movie stars Letitia Wright, Angela Bassett, and Tenno Cuerta, and Ryan Coogler is once again in the director's chair. In the aftermath of King T'Challa's death, the people of Wakanda are each handling their grief in their own way. Some handle it pretty well, others not so much. They can't grieve for long, however, as a deposit of vibranium has been discovered outside of Wakanda for the first time in... pretty much ever. Naturally, many people are rushing to claim this vibranium, but it turns out it has already been claimed by a previously undiscovered underwater civilization led by the man known as Namor. Or Namor. They say it both ways, it's weird. I really like the first Black Panther movie. Coogler is a very talented filmmaker and did an amazing job. Certainly helped that he had a hell of a cast to work with, including Chadwick Boseman, R.I.P. And I, for one, wish we saw more of T'Challa and the Wakandans in Infinity War and Endgame. And I think the reason we didn't is Marvel just didn't realize what they had on their hands when they released Black Panther. And that's even more tragic in hindsight, considering what happened to Mr. Boseman and the people behind the sequel to Black Panther certainly had a hell of a task on their hands to carry on after his death. They elected not to recast, which pretty much means the character has to be killed off, and that's exactly what happens right at the beginning of the movie. This thing is gonna kick you directly in the feels. And honestly, I think they handled it about as well as they could have. It was certainly sad and definitely tugged at your emotions, but not in a way that felt exploitative. And in the aftermath of his death, Wakanda, now led once again by Queen Ramonda, played once again by Angela Bassett, has to deal with fucking white people. Other countries are complaining that Wakanda is not living up to the late King T'Challa's promise of outreach, but the impression I got is they were just being greedy. And the Queen absolutely lets them have it because she has been through a lot in the last year, and she's not about to take any grief from you, thank you very much. Also, half the world is trying to get their hands on that sweet vibranium, and the Americans in particular have a way to track it, thanks to an invention from a young college student named Riri, played by Dominique Thorne. And I like this new character. She's very intelligent and resourceful, and a bit starstruck when she meets Shuri and Okoye. I just wish she had been given more to do. Because she is responsible for the vibranium detector, everyone wants a piece of her, and it seemed like she was going to be a pretty important character through the first act, but after that she was basically reduced to a MacGuffin. And I'm not sure she was ever intended to be a big part of the story, it seems like she's mainly here so this movie can serve as a backdoor pilot for her upcoming Disney Plus series. We also have the return of Martin Freeman as Everett Ross, and Julia Louis-Dreyfus as... Valentina Allegra de Fontaine. Boy, that name does not roll off the tongue. Yes, she is still hanging around, mostly staying in the background, but clearly plotting something nefarious. And her presence in this movie led to a kind of a weird moment. There was a bit of a reveal involving her and Everett that really kind of came out of nowhere and didn't really amount to anything. It made me wonder why they bothered. It was just like, oh, well, that's interesting. Okay, moving on. Lupita Nyong'o, Denai Guerrera, and Winston Duke are back as Nakia, Okoye, and M'Baku. All of them are great, especially M'Baku. When is he getting a Disney Plus series? That needs to happen. And I do like the banter between these characters. It feels very genuine, and it's funny, but it doesn't feel like they're quipping just for the sake of it. There is a moment in this movie where we get a bit of a conflict between the Queen and General Okoye that I honestly had a hard time buying. Like, I get what they were trying to go for, but I really did not buy the Queen acting in that manner. It just, it, it didn't feel right. The main focus of the movie is Shuri, played once again by Letitia Wright, who is dealing with her grief in a very different way than most Wakandans, as they tend to be a very spiritual people. Shuri has not the tongue for it. In fact, I think the first thing Shuri says in the movie is, Bast, if you save my brother's life, I promise I will never question your existence again. And that goes about as well as you'd expect. And Shuri tries to deal with it in her own way, but has a really hard time letting go of her brother. And in spite of Letitia Wright's recent clownery, look it up if you don't know, or maybe you shouldn't, maybe ignorance is bliss, but in spite of all that, her performance is very good and it's hard not to feel bad for her, even when her grief is leading her down a very dark path, which leads to a cameo that I was not expecting. Uh, 
My only complaint about that cameo is I wish they had done a bit more with it. But it was nice to see this character, and while it was unexpected, it totally works. And the other big focus of the movie is Tenokwerta as Namor. Or Namor. He pronounces it Namor, the Wakandans say Namor for some reason. I don't know why. I mean, in a way, I kind of get it, because I always pronounce the character's name Namor until I saw this movie. But if he's going to introduce himself as Namor, to have everyone else pronounce it differently is just weird. But name pronunciation aside, Huerta is really good in this. May very well have stolen the show. This is probably one of my favorite characters in the MCU now. Compared to his comic book origins, he has gone through a few changes, but it actually works pretty well, I thought. His people come from the underwater kingdom of Talokan, which is basically the MCU Atlantis. Once upon a time, they were Mayans, but they turned to the sea to escape their colonizers. And there's a bit of Greek myth mixed in with them as well, as they have a sort of siren song that can stop people from fighting and thus win the battle before it even starts. And Namor is unique among his people in that he can easily travel between land, sea, and air, because those wings on his ankles allow him to fly. And there's a lot of interesting stuff going on between Namor and Shuri. Namor clearly has a very deep love for his people and would do anything to protect him, which Shuri can respect, and indeed she probably sees a little bit of T'Challa in him because of it. But unlike the late King of Wakanda, Namor is willing to do anything to protect his people and is not about to let those pesky morals get in the way. Sort of like another character we've seen in this universe. He does have some similarities to Killmonger in a way. You don't agree with the guy's methods necessarily, but you understand where he's coming from. And he has gone to some dark places, and there is a danger Shuri might be going down the same path. Visually, the movie looks fantastic. No surprises there. Wakanda still looks amazing. And the underwater nation of Talokan looks great as well, although it's not always easy to show it off because when you're that far underwater, it gets a bit dark. Namor in particular looks fantastic. I never actually thought I would see this character on the big screen, but here he is and they nailed it. Especially during the action sequences when he's just flying around and wrecking shit. I had a lot of fun with that. And without giving too much away, yes, we do get a new Black Panther. I won't say who, although for most people, I don't think it'll be a surprise. And there is a mid credit scene, which once again, will kick you right in the feels. And that's a bit unusual in a way, because typically when they throw a scene in the credits, they're either hyping the next movie or they're just doing something very silly. But that's not what they did here. They decided to end it on a much more emotional note, which actually, given the way the movie started, was rather fitting. Overall, despite a few minor flaws and Letitia Wright's recent clownery, this was very well made and I enjoyed it very much. And I highly recommend checking it out, especially if you were a fan of the first movie. That's all I have to say about Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Till next time, take care.